But Jesus, I thank you that you do abide with me. You abide with us. And now may we abide with you. Amen. Hey, it's great to see you. Um, as I think you know, we've been preaching through the book of Romans. And uh, next week we'll be on Romans chapter 4. And uh, this week we're taking a break because Carl's preaching. Um, actually, I was on the way to church this morning by Green Mountain, and I got this phone call, and I went, oh, shoot, it's Carl. And he said, hey, Peter, I'm so sorry, but I'm sick, and I've been hanging out with a, someone who has COVID. So um, we'll pray for Carl that he gets better. Um, and then I'm kind of excited to preach on this topic. I, on my desk, I kind of had an emergency sermon this may be one of my favorite sermons, and it really has to do with what we've been talking about in the book of Romans. You know, uh, we titled the whole series, uh, Paul's Epistle to the Romans, Say Daddy, because in Romans chapter 8, uh, Paul says, sorry if you're seeing my belly button, I've got to move my, move my cord here. In Romans chapter 8, Paul says, we've not been given a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but we've been given the spirit of a sonship. For when we cry, Abba, or, or it's, uh, for um, when we say "Abba, Father," we cry "Abba, Father" by the Spirit. It's the Spirit of Christ in us that's crying uh, "Abba, Father." So I think Paul is working toward the idea that we're talking about today. So um, let's pray and ask God to bless us. All right, Father, I pray that Your truth, Jesus, would inhabit everything that we say. And that, Lord God, you would give us the courage to believe what's true. Um, this whole world, Lord, would tell us something different. But I pray that we would hear your word. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Fred Craddock was, uh, is one of my favorite preachers of all time. And he used to tell about an encounter that he had one day uh, on vacation in the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee. It was actually the last day of vacation. Kids were at Grandma. Fred and his uh, wife were coming home through the, the mountains and decided to stop at their favorite little cafe called the Blackberry Inn. They didn't want to, they didn't want to be bothered. And during the last day of vacation, when this old fellow walked into the restaurant, started talking to everybody, Fred thought to himself, oh, please just, you know, let me eat my pie in peace. But sure enough, this old guy meandered over to Fred's table and said, you folks on vacation? He said, yes, yes, we are. He said, are you going to be here long? Fred said, no, no, we're not going to be here long at all. And then he said, what do you do? Which was the question that he had been waiting for because he had an answer that he was convinced would shut him down, scared folks off. He said, well, I'm a professor of homiletics in the Chandler School of Theology at Emory University in Atlanta. And the old guy all of a sudden just lit up and he said, well, you're a preacher man. And I got a preacher story for you. And he pulled up a chair and he sat down at Fred's table said, I was born back in these mountains. My mama wasn't married. The other women in town, they used to spend their time guessing who my daddy was. And I didn't know who my daddy was. That was a real problem back then. It's different now. My mama worked a lot. The other kids weren't allowed to play with a boy like me. So I'd hide in the woods at recess. I ate my lunch alone. They said I wasn't any good, said I wouldn't ever amount to anything. The kids used to call me Ben the Bastard Boy. Ben the Bastard Boy, Ben the Bastard Boy, Ben the Bastard I thought Bastard was my last name. By this time, the old man had started to weep. He collected himself, said, I'm sorry. What I was meaning to tell you was that there was this church in Laurel Springs, had a preacher whose voice was big like God. I knew church wasn't a, a place for boys like me, but sometimes I'd sneak in and sit toward the back, fixing to sneak out as soon as the service was about to end. Well, this one day, that preacher, he, 
He just went on. He went on and on. And I got all wrapped up in what he was saying. Before I knew it, church was over. The aisles, they jammed up. Folks was looking at me. I was making my way toward the back door quick as I could when all of a sudden I felt this big hand whoop on my shoulder. And I heard that voice. It was big like God. Boy! Was a preacher man. He said, boy, and, and I froze, I froze. He said, boy, who's your daddy? It was like a knife getting stuck into my heart. And then he said, boy, I know who your daddy is. And the old man said, I thought to myself, does he really know who my daddy is? Boy, I know who your daddy is. And then he kind of like paused, like forever. So everybody was looking. Everybody was listening. Boy, I know who your daddy is. You're, you're, let's see, you're, a, you're, a, you're, why, you're, you're a child of God. And I see a striking resemblance. Then he swatted me on the bottom and said, now you run along and you claim your inheritance. The old guy looked up at Professor Craddock and, and said, uh, Professor, uh, I was born that day. Then the old guy got up and left. Immediately, the waitress came running over to the table saying, what did he say? What did he say? What did he say? And Craddock, he looked at the waitress and he said, well, he told me, uh, he told me a story. Why do you ask? She looked at him a moment and then she said, don't you know who that is? That's Ben Hooper. Ben Hooper, the bastard boy, elected twice the governor of Tennessee. Bastard boy, illegitimate boy. Couldn't have been that illegitimate if his daddy was, was God. 1 John 3, 1, this is the verse. Uh, Behold, idete in Greek, it means look. You pay attention to this. You look at this, pay attention to this. Chew on this. What manner of love the Father has given to, has lavished upon us, that we should be called the children, the techna, the little children, little kids of God. And that's not just what we're called, it's what we really are. Edete is imperative tense. It means you better pay attention to this. You better consider it. You better ponder it. You better put it in your pipe and smoke it. Smoke what? The kind of love that God has for you. You know, I tend to think that the love of God is like this ontological, philosophically mandated necessity, right? God is love, so he kind of has to love me. It's his duty. But John is saying, don't you see, don't you get it, Peter? How he feels about you, the kind of love that it is. Just take a look at it. It's, it's daddy love. That's the kind of love it is. It appears that Jesus used the word Abba when speaking of his Father in heaven. That's an Aramaic word. The word shows up in the epistles because Paul seems to want to preserve it for some reason. Like, you need to get the point of this word. English translators seem afraid to translate it, yet the translation is uh, fairly clear. The word Abba means daddy, like Dada, Papa, Abba. It's a child's first word, and then the father claims it as his own. See, he said, Daddy, da, 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 that's my name, I'm Daddy. So we're talking about Daddy love. In the Judaism of Jesus' day, to refer to God as your own father was considered scandalous. God was the father of Israel, maybe the nation, but to refer to him as your own father was, was scandalous, let alone to address him as, as Daddy. Well, Jesus didn't just refer to God as his own Abba, his own daddy or father. Remember, he said, pray our father. So that means he probably would have said, pray our Abba. He commanded us to pray our Abba as if his daddy was our daddy. And he didn't say this to some group of super Christians, you remember? Do you remember when he said it? He just said it to a group of people on a hillside. They were just the confused folks that followed him up on the side of the hill, and it could have been that one of them's name was, was Judas. Romans, Gentiles, whoever happened to be there. 
Jesus from the bosom of the Father, truth incarnate, who would never command a person to lie, he commanded them and he commands you, saying, pray our Father. Pray our Abba, our Daddy. In John 17, Jesus says to the Father, remember he's praying, he says, Dad, you love them as you love me. Did you get that? So that means the way that God feels about Jesus is the way God feels about you. Behold what manner, the kind of love, the Father has given to us. Now, I've spent, seriously, 20 years defending the theological veracity of that statement, that assertion that God is love. But now John is saying, now just stop, look, and, and say, wow, that's incredible. Behold what kind of love it is, what manner of love that the Father has given to us. So let's behold it and just consider it a, a little bit. This is a picture of my son Coleman. Sasha, you have this picture. I, I've shown it to you before. This is, uh, this is Coleman. He thinks he's cool and important. He's wearing cowboy boots around the house. But in this picture, he's in a panic and he's distressed because he's got his musical potty chair stuck on his head. His musical potty chair that plays row, row, row your boat. And he's particularly distressed because I'm not helping him. I'm just taking a picture. I have this picture framed and hanging right by the, the door in my office. You know, I think uh, I'm important. Many times I leave my office terribly distressed and in a panic, and this picture reminds me who I really am. <laughs> I'm a little child of God with a potty chair stuck on his head. <laughs> God knows me as I truly am, and this is my point. He likes me. I, I really, really like my son Coleman. That's how I feel about him. However, if you stood in my living room with a potty chair stuck on your head and a diaper wearing cowboy boots, I wouldn't feel the same about you. <laughs> you're not my child. You are God's child, that's how God feels about you, but you're not my child and I'm not your daddy. So you see, I'm just saying daddy love is unique. It's different from other kinds of love. It's unearned. You can't earn it. Coleman didn't earn it. A baby can't do anything to earn love. You know what they do? They suck, literally. They suckle. That's, they're just born suckling and pooping. And that's about it. But daddies and mommies, they die for babies. That shocked me as a new dad. This new kind of love that I hadn't experienced before. They didn't earn it. I didn't earn it. It, it just showed up in me and not to my credit. I didn't tell myself I have to do it. I just did it. Almost every night when my children were little, I'd sneak into their rooms and I'd just watch them while they'd sleep captured by the wonder of their mere existence. I remember thinking over and over again, how this, and this surprised me, you know what I mean, as a new dad, I'd look at him and I'd think, how could I ever not love you? Then they became teenagers. <laughs> now they're young adults. They were actually all home for, for Christmas, just left a couple days ago. They have conditions, successes, failures, good days, bad days, but all I have to do is remember they are still at least this, my, my baby. That miracle, that miracle that showed up. And then they're just more than easy to love, more than easy to love. So good daddy love is unconditional. You can make God glad, sad, angry, mad, but you can't make God love you any more or any less than he does right now. So good daddy love is unique, it's unearned, it's unconditional, and it's intensely uh, passionate. 
I've told you this, but one day, because this surprised me and it means so much to me, but one day when Elizabeth was about three, I took her to the park and she stood on top of the slide in the park that she had just learned to go down. And I remember she'd stand there on the top and she'd just say, see, I do it, I do it, see, I do it, I do it. And then she'd slide down the slide. And I would go, yeah, you are awesome, Elizabeth. That's utterly amazing. And I actually meant it. After a while, I remember I went and I sat down and I just watched, amazed at the sheer wonder of her mere existence. And then this woman and her daughter came along and started using the same slide. This mother would watch her little girl go down the slide and, and then just yell, great job, that was incredible, sweetheart, praising her as she slid down the slide. And then Elizabeth would climb to the top of the slide and say, see me, see me, and the woman wouldn't even look. After a time, Elizabeth was standing there just screaming at the top of her lungs, see me, see me, I do it, I do it, I do it, and the lady wouldn't even turn her head. We're each so much like Elizabeth, right? That's what we do every day. That's what we say to the world. See me, see me, see me, I do it, I do it, I do it, and the world ignores us or says, yeah, you know, so what? But not the Father. He sees. He sees you. Well, finally, Elizabeth was just yelling at the top of her lungs. See me, I do it, I do it. But this lady wouldn't even look at my daughter. I'm watching this, and I remember just growing furious with rage. I fantasized about picking up this two-by-four that was lying next to me, going over and smacking the lady in the head and say, Damn it, look at my daughter! She's the greatest slide slider this world has ever seen! People say they don't understand the wrath of God. But I think dads do. Every good daddy does. It's the fluid that love bleeds. It's the burning edge of love. And I was just burning with wrath, just about to go over there, judge her, condemn her, whack her in the head when I sense God whisper in my heart, hey, Peter, what if that lady over at the foot of the slide is my little girl? Just like Elizabeth is... You're a little girl. What if every child starving to death right now in sub-Saharan Africa is my child? What if every little kid sitting in the dump just south of here in Tijuana is my little kid? They cry, see me, see me, feed me, feed me, and you don't even look. Maybe you should drop to your knees in gratitude that I've turned my white hot wrath upon myself instead of you. For you see, Peter, my son, I love you in this way too. What if God loves everyone in the world the way I love Elizabeth? And yet everyone in the world refuses to see each other. What does a good father do with all his wrath? Oh, I don't know exactly how to explain it, but I think he issues judgment and then he bears his own judgment within himself until all his children see his judgment and learn to love as he loves. What if God loves me? What if he loves me the way I love my daughter, but I don't see me? Maybe I hate me. Maybe I'm my own worst enemy. Wouldn't God's wrath burn towards me precisely because he loves me? and wants to set me free? I mean, maybe he destroys the false me in order to liberate the true me, and that's what Paul is working towards in Romans. We'll start reading about it along about chapter five. But anyway, daddy love is unique. It's unearned, unconditional, intense, and it's sacrificial. So this is a wild thought, but God's love makes him vulnerable to you. I'm most vulnerable to the people I love. So who can hurt me the most? My children, my bride. Who can hurt God the most? You. You know, it wasn't nails that held Jesus to that wood. It was his love for you. Daddy love is vulnerable. And by the way, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So if you want to know what the Father looks like, you. You look at Jesus, that's his heart hanging on the tree. 
But daddy love is vulnerable and it never comes to an, an end. Wrath comes to an end. Revelation 15, 1. With this, the wrath of God is ended, but the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. That line is repeated over and over again throughout the Old Testament. So it, it may seem like the mercies do come to an end, but that's because good daddies are willing to discipline, even very severely. And yet all the discipline is love. When my son John was about four, a man came over to fix the furnace. We went downstairs. I remember standing there with John while he's watching the man adjust the burner on the, on the furnace. And John, he turned to me at one point in obvious distress and he said, Daddy, what's that? And I said, oh, well, buddy, those flames heat the, heat the water so that we can have, you know, warm water when we wash our hands or take a bath or whatever. Now, actually, that was a lie because it was the furnace, but I wasn't thinking. I thought it, like it was the water heater, but that's, that's what I said. Well, over the next few days, we noticed that John started having accidents. He had been doing well with the whole potty training thing, you know, but he was wetting his pants, pooing in his underwear, and then he refused to take a bath for like a few days. And when I inquired as to what was going on, he, he told me, well, Daddy, the flames will come up and burn me. They'll burn me. I tried to explain to John that the flames couldn't come through the water pipes. I mean, I gave him a great explanation of indoor plumbing and heating and all that stuff. Grandma even came over and said, look, John, I'm putting my hand, and she did, this is my mom, putting my hand in the toilet and it's not on fire, John. Didn't do any good, though. Terror had imprisoned my son in a lie. So finally, Susan and I sat down and we had a conversation and we issued judgment. That night when I could tell that Coleman was fully loaded, I took him by the hand screaming and crying because uh, this was the plan to make sure he knew that the poo-poo went in the potty. We took him down, we put it in there, and, and then I, I held him to the toilet seat. Well, actually, he, he, I think he had to go, and, and I could tell he had to go, but I wanted to make sure he would go. I remember holding them there. Few times in my life have I encountered such terror in a person, but I held him there, screaming, crying, until the deed was done. God can teach us such, he can teach us things in really strange places. Scripture says this, God disciplines those he loves. So you see, he would literally hold us to the fire, according to Karl Barth, and burn us right down to faith. Scripture says our faith is tested like gold and refined by fire. So you understand, I held John to that toilet because I loved him. I held him to the flaming toilet of death because I wanted him to share my joy. And what's that? A social life? <laughs> Friends? Clean underwear? John's 33 now. He was home this last week, and I want to tell you that perfect love has cast out fear. He will sit on the toilet for hours without fear now. <laughs> but now um, imagine if during that time, while I was disciplining John, maybe holding him to the flaming toilet of death, imagine if someone counseled John during that time. Imagine if the person said this, John, you better fear your daddy because he will not let you live in your own filth. As long as you keep pooping your pants, your dad will come hold you to the toilet. You cannot escape his discipline or hide from his judgment. If you're 60 years old, hiding in a cave in, in Alaska, but still pooing your pants, your 87-year-old daddy will hunt you down, find a toilet, hold you to it, fear him because he loves you, and his love will not stop. It's eternal. Well, if someone would have said that to John at that time, it would have been weird, right? It would have been really weird. But it would have been good. It would have been good counsel. But now imagine if someone else came along and whispered this in my son's ear. Jonathan, you better fear your daddy because one day his love will stop. His patience will run out and then he'll punish you. 
He will torment and torture you forever without end, and if you cry out for mercy, there will be no mercy. It's too late. His mercy has come to an end. If someone had whispered that in my son's ear, oh, well, my son might obey me. I mean, he'd honor me with his lips, in the words of Isaiah, but his heart would be far, far, far from me. It's hard to think of anything that would be more damaging to my son's faith, his trust in me, than that, or anything that would engender more rage or anger in me than someone saying stuff like that to my kid. And yet we say stuff like that to God's kids, don't we? But if God's love is daddy love, we ought to think twice about statements like that. Good daddies will discipline very severely at times, but they have no interest in endlessly torturing their own children. Scripture clearly states that God's wrath comes to an end. But the steadfast love of the Lord never ends. It is the end. Jesus is the end. So good daddy love is relentless, empathetic, and compassionate. When Coleman was little, we'd punish him by putting him on the green couch. Sometimes he'd do something bad. He'd just go sit there on his own. I'd find him there and say, Coleman, what would you do? And then he'd, he'd confess. He'd sit there and confess to me, and he'd no longer be alone. Well, Coleman spent a whole lot of time on the green couch. And I spent a whole lot of time on the green couch with him. I'd go there just to be with him. The day you eat of it, you will surely die, says God the Father. And then in Jesus, he chooses to die with us and even to descend into Hades with us just to be with us. Hades is a lot like that green couch. It's a lot like time out. That's the word that often gets translated hell in the Old Testament. There's another word that gets translated hell too, and that's Gehenna. And that's the presence of the fire. And Gehenna is a lot like my presence next to Coleman on the couch <laughs> when he's angry at me. Then my presence burns. Well, anyway, good daddy love is unique, unearned, unconditional, intensely passionate, sacrificial, relentless, and empathetic. It seeks the heart. Good daddy love desires faith. And, you know, that's what Romans is like all about up to this point. God wants faith. He desires faith. That's what he's doing. One day, many years ago, I was driving up our street. The kids were in the back in the, Coleman wasn't born yet. Three of them were in the back in their car seats, so they were buckled in. And my wife, Susan, was up next to me in the front. And I don't know, I just had to spit. That's the way it is with guys sometimes. But I'm driving up the street, and I rolled down the window, and I just, you know, let it fly. Within like a second, I hear all over the, the back seat. I turn around, the kids are just spitting all over the windows because they can't get the, the window down. And well, Susan, she didn't think it was very funny. She gave me the look. But I was not ashamed of the children. I was not disappointed in the children. I was proud. Why? Because my kids trusted me. My kids wanted to be like me. I mean, sure, we would have to work on the hakalugi skills and all that as time went by, but I had what I wanted, and what I wanted was faith. I wanted trust. Daddy love desires faith, and faith is reckoned as righteousness. That's what we've just been reading in Romans, right? Faith is rightness. Anything done in faith for your father is right. It's beautiful. It's good. And so your heavenly father delights in the scribbles that you call art. It's your stupid pictures that he tapes on his refrigerator and everybody sees when they come to his house. Although he can listen to countless choirs of angels, he listens to you. And he doesn't notice that you're off key. Because you're his kid. You're his priority. I grew up in a busy church with a busy and important pastor. He didn't have enough time for everybody's needs, but any time I had a need, he'd just, he'd drop everything just for me. I had the key to his office. I'd go in whenever I chose. I had the pastor wrapped around 
my little finger, the pastor of First Presbyterian Church in Littleton. Why? Because I was the best parishioner? No. I was the worst. I made the Sunday school teacher quit. My initials were carved next to Bobby Vandekoppel's in the pew in the balcony. It wasn't because I was the best parishioner. It was because the pastor was my dad. See, to my dad, I was, I was more important than his reputation. And I know that's not true of a lot of pastors' kids, but with my dad, that was true. I was more important than any institution, including the church. Or maybe I should say I was the church. I was his church. I was his priority. And you are God's priority. He watches you when you sleep. Your picture's in his wallet. His, your arts and crafts are on his desk. He dreams your dreams. He laughs at your jokes. He cries your tears. And you are more important than his reputation. And so he emptied himself, took the form of a slave, made himself of no reputation, and humbled himself to the point of death, and even death on a cross. I remember lying in uh, a hospital bed in fourth grade, recovering from extensive knee surgery. I think it was the worst pain, I think I can honestly say this, at 60, it was the worst pain that I've ever felt in, in my life. I remember my father leaning over the side of the bed with the most intense, compassionate, serious countenance. He said, oh, Peter, I wish that there was some way I could take your place. I remember looking back at my father and thinking, you're nuts. What on earth could possess a person to actually think that or say that? And now I know. It's daddy love. Your father uh, in heaven not only wills such a thing, somehow in Christ he, he did such a thing. He suffers every pain you suffer, weeps every tear you cry. Is he crazy? Yeah, he is crazy. He's crazy. He's crazy with love for you. So daddy love is unique, it's unearned, it's unconditional, it's intensely passionate, sacrificial, vulnerable, relentless, and it seeks the heart and endures all things. Listen closely, because I can back this up by Scripture. Good daddy love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. John says, behold, look at the kind of love that God has for you. And what does the Father want from us? Just that. <laughs> to look. To behold to ingest even. Years ago, Elizabeth was having a no good, very bad day. She was mean to everyone. Uh, lectures, threats, spankings weren't doing any good. And, and that night, I remember, I said, okay, look, let's all just go out to dinner. In the van on the way there, she was picking fights with her brothers and her sisters. And I mean, she was just looking for trouble. After I parked the van, I said, okay, everybody inside. Everybody inside except you, Elizabeth. You're staying here with me. And I sat her down in the front seat, and I just, I stared her down, and I said, Elizabeth, what has gotten into you? I remember she looked back up at me with those big eyes, and she said, well, I know, but I'm not telling you. I didn't know what to do at that point. So after a while, I finally just made her sit on my lap, and I could tell that my presence burned. St. Paul wrote this. Remember, this was in Romans. It's his kindness that leads us to repentance. What was burning in Elizabeth? It was her pride, right? Her five-year-old pride. My kindness burned her pride. I just, I remember I just, I held her for a long time, not kind of knowing quite what to do until she cracked. And she said to me, she said, Daddy, do you, do you remember when you came to our kindergarten class? I said, yeah. She said, do you remember Kelly? And I said, yeah. She was this little girl. I remember when I went to her kindergarten, she just glommed onto me, like hung onto my leg and wouldn't let go. 
Then Elizabeth said, well, Daddy Kelly said that. You said that. You didn't love me anymore. You loved her. And then she just like burst into this fountain of tears. After she cried for a while, I remember I said, Elizabeth, does Kelly have a daddy? Yes, she answered, but Kelly said he just moved away from Kelly and her mommy. And then I said, Elizabeth, look at me. Look at me. I will always love you. That will not change. Please do not doubt my love for you, for when you doubt my love for you, it hurts me. And when you doubt, please come tell me so that I can just tell you again, I love you. What's gotten into you? Answer, a lie. From where? Hell. A lie from hell that creates hell. The enemy whispers, the Father doesn't love you. Have you heard that whisper? He whispers, his mercies come to an end. That was one too many times. The Father doesn't love you, his mercies come to an end. I call that Satan's big butt. The church preaches the gospel, which is the word of Jesus. Jesus, which means God is salvation. The church preaches, God is your Father, God loves you, God saves you, and Satan whispers, but hell. But God tortures some people endlessly. He's got them in the basement right now. And it's too late, and he will not change his mind. You cannot trust him. Satan has been whispering, but hell, even through the church, ever since about 350 A.D. I think that we're called to expose his big butt. But first, we need to make sure it's not our big butt. You see, the essence of all spiritual warfare, and I could back this up with a ton of freaky stories, but the essence of all spiritual warfare is beholding the love that God has for us in Christ Jesus. It's not an option. I guess that's the thing that keeps getting pounded in my head. It's not an option. It's an imperative. You must. You must renounce the lie that God the Father does not love you and he's not powerful enough to save you. So I'm saying renounce it every day. Take time every day to behold your Father's love for you. Take time to lay down your gadgets and your toys and just sit on his lap in his presence, not praying through a list, not making resolutions, not promising anything, not intending anything, but just doing that, considering, beholding, enjoying the fact that your daddy is completely, furiously, passionately in love with you right now, right here, as you are, without accomplishing one thing. If you want to have to achieve something, if you want to have to strive for something, if you want to have to earn something, you've missed it. And you're not beholding it. You can't do anything to earn it. But if you behold it, it will do all sorts of things to you and in you. It will transform you. The Father's love creates us in his own image. I think that's what we'll discover by the end of the book of Romans. 1 John 3, verse 1, John says it this way, Behold, look, see what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called the little children of God, and so we are. That's what we really are. Verse 3, And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Paul put it this way in Ephesians. He said, Be imitators of God as beloved children. Believe you are a beloved child of God and you will imitate God whether you consciously choose to do so or not. You'll just spit all over the window on the inside of the car. Sometimes people ask me, why are you a pastor? I know part of the answer is I think God tricked me into it. 
But maybe the most important answer is that I'm imitating my dad. And I'm imitating my dad because I beheld the love of God in my dad. And I couldn't explain it by this world. Daddy love validates us, creates us, and shapes us in its own image. Daddy love is incredibly powerful stuff. In fact, psychologists say that parents, particularly, particularly fathers, shape our view of reality and then how we relate to reality. And maybe that's because oftentimes in a traditional father, the father is the one that's coming in and out of the house and relating to the world out there. But that, that relationship shapes our view of reality so much that by the age of three, according to psychologists, your view of reality is set. You can't help it. And to unlearn it, you'd have to, like, die and be born again. And so for some, reality has been awfully bleak. And for some, this sermon is incredibly frustrating and painful. Because for some, well, your story is not like mine. It's more like uh, Ben Hooper's. Perhaps your father made you hate yourself. I mean, maybe your father betrayed you and molested you and abandoned you, abused you. And now the horror of it all is that you look in the mirror and see your father. <laughs> I mean, that's the nightmare, right? I once my, heard my aunt tell about a man she knew born in 1919. He grew up in the Depression in a family of 13 children. His father failed at two or three businesses and he turned to alcohol and he became abusive. One night, this boy awoke out of a sound sleep to the sound of screaming. He ran downstairs to see his father drunk and waving a rifle around a kit the kitchen and his mother was hanging onto the stock of the rifle screaming, no, don't do it, don't do it. And he was screaming, where are them sons of bitches? I'm gonna kill all of them sons of bitches. And it was only then that his older brother burst out of the kitchen, ran across the fields in Nebraska, frozen fields to the neighbor's house and, and they called the police and the police came and, and took this boy's father away. Now, psychologists would tell you that that boy will very likely grow up to be just like his father, abusive, cruel, limited in his ability to love. But that boy was the most compassionate, loving, kind man I've ever known. That was, boy was my, my daddy. I'd hear those stories from my aunt because <laughs> my dad wouldn't tell him. It was like he had forgiven and forgotten and he would only speak well of his dad. I'd hear him talk and I remember I'd just be shocked at who my daddy was because he was so remarkably different than my uncles, my relatives. So what happened to my dad? Same thing that happened to Ben Hooper. Same thing that happened to Paul, the chief of sinners. Same thing that happened to John the Beloved, who was once named John the Son of Thunder because of his anger. By the power of Jesus, when my dad was 19 years old, living in Denver before World War II, my daddy met his true father. He heard the judgment. He heard the word. He heard the preacher say, Boy, I know who your daddy is. Your daddy is God. My father believed that judgment and claimed that inheritance. So what's this about? Well, this is your inheritance. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus, the only begotten Son of God, took bread and broke it, saying, this is my body given to you, take and eat. And in the same manner, after supper, he took the cup, and he said, this is the covenant in my blood poured out, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. There's nothing in here, Susan. Do you, can you grab some wine? Okay, well, there is, here I go, there is wine over here. So, but he did that, and there's wine over here, and that counts, okay? 
Oh, you don't have to bring it up here, honey. Yeah, that's okay, because it's over there. And Jesus said, the life is in the blood. So when you come to this table, you understand that you're drinking Jesus' life into yourself. And in Romans, that's what we read last time in 3, that Jesus, um, he's the propitiation, and we're justified by faith in his blood, as if faith is really in his blood, as if the Spirit is really in his blood. And then in Romans 8, Paul says this, God has not given you a spirit of fear to fall back in, or a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. He's given you a spirit of sonship. For when we cry, Abba, Father, it is the Spirit himself bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs provided we suffer with him that we may also be glorified with him. So when you say, Abba, Father, that's not just you saying it. That's the only begotten Son of God descended into your heart, saying it with you and reminding you, hey, the way Dad feels about me is the way he feels about you. So in Jesus' name, come to the table and claim your inheritance. Amen. You rescued me so I could stand child of God, oh, I am a child of God, yes, I am a child of God, oh, I am a child of God. So close your eyes. Jesus said, you must become like little children to enter the kingdom. And so uh, become like a little child. Imagine yourself five years old. And you're scared. You're standing in the darkness. And your arms are full. You're holding your toys, your possessions, your addictions, your accomplishments, your judgments. your guilt. You hold them as security against the darkness. The things that you think you've achieved. The ways that you punish yourself in fear of being punished by someone else. And you think that these things, what you have done, what you have not done, you think they tell you who you are. But listen. I know who your daddy is. Your daddy is God. And now maybe you can see this because it's the truth. Two hands reach down out of the darkness. There are nail prints in the hands. 
and you begin to drop your toys, those things that you hang on to so tightly. And now imagine him just picking you up, placing you on his lap, and enfolding you in his arms. Don't promise anything. Don't vow anything. Don't hide anything. Right now, you don't even need to say anything. Just sit there. Behold his love. And then say Abba. Now, I'm not going to swat you on the bottom because I would get in trouble for that. But if I could, I would swat you on the bottom and say, Now, 2022, you run along and you claim your inheritance. In Jesus' name, believe the gospel. Amen. Amen. If you'd like prayer, um, I think... Ted will be down here, members of the prayer team, they'd love to pray with you.